Okay, everyone. So welcome to the first 0 0.1 session of 2022. Um, I see some familiar names from last year's sessions, but um, for those who haven't been before, these sessions are designed as an educational tool and educational resource for both our athletes and coaches and even officials and any interested parties. And essentially the name 0 0.1 comes from the idea of very small percentages um, winning or losing competitions, as well as the small things that you do day in, day out that uh, lead to performances, whether it be good or whether it be bad. So these sessions, we have two speakers on every time. We have an athlete and then uh, an expert in their field. Um, sometimes they're similar topics, sometimes they're not. And um, yeah, it's designed to, uh, to help all the people in athletics. Um, Ontario membership to, to get better and to learn more. So without further ado, we have two wonderful speakers tonight. Um, first up, we have Kate ben Um, Kate is probably a familiar face and name to most of you on the call. Um, and uh, she'll be speaking tonight um, a little bit about some mental health um, topics that don't really get talked about a lot. I think there's been a lot more discussion around mental health in the last couple of years because it's been such a prevalent topic. Um, but for those who don't know Kate, she is, um, she's from Canada, she's from Ontario, Brampton born. She started uh, a long time ago in track and field. First national team, I believe, is 2013. And around that time, she won two national titles in the 1500 metres. Uh, a few years later, she made her first Olympic team last year uh, of the 2020 Tokyo Games in the five kilometers. And in between that, she's gone through lots of ups and downs. So I'm sure she'll talk a bit about them tonight. Um, Kate, thank you so much for being here with us and welcome. Um, and I know you've got some other things going on at the moment with your podcast. So I'll leave that to you to discuss and sort of um, if you want to put in the chat any information about sort of contacts and sort of how to listen to you more and that sort of thing. And what I would say to everyone else listening, if you, um, if you do have any questions, please um, just write them down in the chat on the side. And, and when Kate's gone through sort of her formal or informal part of the presentation and what she wants to talk about, we'll um, hit her up with some questions. So um, Kate, thank you so much again, and I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much. Appreciate that intro. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks again to Athletics Ontario, to Brendan and all the good folks on this call for, for hosting. Um, so uh, yeah, again, thank you for the intro. Yes, I'm Kate. My, uh, my main events are the 1500 and the 5000 meter. I've dabbled also in cross country over the years. Actually, my first uh, national team was um, a junior national team at the World Cross Country Championships many moons ago. So I know that probably some of the younger athletes either on the call tonight or listening um, uh, after the fact will find it funny for me to reflect a little bit on how long ago I made those first teams. But um, as Brendan said, mental health has been, um, of course, a, a topic of increasing importance and increasing conversation, um, both in our, our general society, but I think especially in our athletic realms. And I think that's, we still have quite a ways to go. And I think that that evolves. But I, I also am really heartened because I've been in sport a long time and I can, I can really attest to the fact that that's changed and grown. Um, significantly. And I think we've made really great strides, pardon the running pun. It's hard to avoid them. Um, so I do want to talk about mental health today, but I, in, in thinking about this presentation and thinking about what I wanted to share with this audience, I started thinking about mental health and its relationship to the longevity that I've had in my running career. And so I wanted to broaden that a little bit and talk um, about, uh, and in fact, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Just bear with me one second. I'm uh, still getting used to figuring out how to do this. Sorry. Share screen. Here we go. All right. So I wanted to talk about mental health and I will definitely uh, touch on that in a significant way. But when I got thinking about what I wanted to share, it, it occurred to me that mental health is so bound up in so much of what my life as a person and an athlete has been that I wanted to put it in the context, the greater context of what this incredible journey through sport has been for me. So this is um, my 25 year Olympic pursuit and how I really maintained and, and obtained longevity in my running career. So that's something I, I feel really strongly about, about sharing tonight with you all. So how did I get 
from nine years old track and field day in my homemade strawberry print outfit. Can I, everyone see this, by the way? Are we good? Can you give me a thumbs up, Brendan? Yeah. Um, in my backyard at nine years old uh, with the start of an Olympic dream to finally 25 years later becoming an Olympian at 34 years old. There's a lot that has gone into this, this journey, but the four main pillars that I really wanna to touch on with the emphasis being on mental health, but the four pillars really are physical health, mental health, life balance, and love of the sport. And the reason I wanna talk about these things is that I think uh, we often see athletes when they're succeeding, and far less often we hear about them when they're struggling or when they've gone through really defining moments that are a lot less uh, full of glory and, and sort of um, overt success. And I wanted to talk about all of those things that have led to this, this long journey of mine. So I'd like to start, if you'll bear with me, by sharing some of my story with you. And this is just a little collage snapshot of uh, the, the many years that I've been in this sport. But I, I grew up in an active family. Um, my parents put my sister and I in soccer at a really young age. Uh, I was five years old when I started playing and I was never all that good in that I didn't have any ball handling skills. I was never the one that scored the goals, but I loved running up and down the field. I had a lot of natural speed and endurance. So I would never play a position. It drove my coaches crazy. I would just cover the whole field and then pass the ball to someone who could do a lot more with it in terms of scoring. Um, also from as young as I can remember, uh, my dad has been a marathon runner. So I had that fluence in my life growing up. And my earliest memories of my dad are that he would go out for these two hour training runs in the middle of winter. And he had a big beard at this time. And he would come home from these training runs with a beard full of icicles. And even at a really young age, I remember thinking that's so badass that it's too cold. Like I, I'm not allowed to go outside because it's so cold, but my dad's out doing two hour runs and coming back with a face full of ice. So those were some of my early inspirations. But one of the, the pinnacle uh, young inspirations of mine was, and I'll be dating myself here, but watching the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, I was nine years old, the same age I was in wearing those, those ribbons. And I watched Donovan Bailey cross the line in the men's hundred meter with a gold for Canada in a new world record. And I remember turning to my dad, and this was when I set my first goal in sport. And I said, Dad, someday I'm going to go to the Olympics and I'm going to win a gold medal and I'm going to beat Donovan Bailey's world record. And he said, that's nice, dear. <laughs> uh, let's try these elementary school meets first. So we did. I, I, was, I had very supportive parents. But that was the, the first time I remember really setting a goal that resonated with sport. Um, so I, you know, I, I progressed through the sport. I joined my first track club in grade six, shout out to the Bramley Bullets. Um, and then I ran through a uh, middle school and joined the Mississauga track club in grade nine. And I continued playing soccer during this time. And I'm a big proponent of athletes participating in a lot of different sports. I think that the skills that I learned through soccer really helped me in my eventual running success, but my energy was really split. So I started to experience more success um, through high school, and I made the decision to quit soccer in, at the end of grade 10. And I realized yeah, I was involved in a lot of extracurriculars and my energy was being too split up. So I decided to focus almost entirely on running and it really worked. So just for some context, in, in grade 10, it was 2003, um, at the Canadian Cross Country Championships, I placed 66th which is a great result. I had worked hard for it. I was really happy with it. But I quit soccer that year and really started focusing on running. And a year later in 2004, I came third at those same cross country junior championships. And I made my first junior national team in grade 11. I competed at the world cross country championships, uh, junior cross country championships that year. I continued to experience a lot of success through high school, through some ups and downs of injury, um, but overall I did really well. I was a Canadian and an officer champion in both cross country and track. I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to Duke University in North Carolina, which is a very prestigious NCAA Division I school. Continued to experience some ups and downs, a few little injury issues. My mental health really deteriorated while I was in college and I'll speak more to that in a minute. But on the track, I was doing really well. I became a two-time All-American. I set an NCAA record. I set numerous Duke uh, uh, team records and I anchored our team to win the four by 800 meters at the Penn Relays, which is a, an amazing uh, sort of national relay event that happens every year. And throughout this whole time, I knew that this Olympic dream was burning bright and I really wanted to compete post-collegiately. 
And so I chose a program and a coach in university. I was really lucky to have a lot of options for where I went to school. And my parents and I worked really hard to choose a coach and a program that would support my long-term success. So this is one of the first points I wanna make, especially to the younger athletes who might be listening, is that um, you'll encounter a number of different coaches and programs and, and philosophies, but my coaches never overraced me. They never saw me as just a point getter. They saw me as someone who they wanted to experience great success and growth in university and then go on to have a healthy, successful career beyond if that's what I wanted. So I finished up school in 2011 with that Olympic dream still burning bright. And the next year was the 2012 Olympic Games in London. So in 2012, I competed in my first Olympic trials in Calgary. And I came fourth by less than half a second in the 1500 meter. And the top three were named to the team and I was fourth. And that was okay. I had never made a senior national team. I was a little bit disappointed, but I used that disappointment and that motivation to fuel me. And I had a couple great years of success after that. I was, I won my first Canadian senior championship in 2013 and made my first world championship team. I won nationals again in 2014. And that year I won my first and only international medal at the Commonwealth Games in the 1500 meter. And it was a really exciting time. And I was feeling really positive about 2016. And in 2015, I started experiencing a lot of injury issues and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. The fall of 2015, I moved out to Victoria, British Columbia to train with our national uh, training center out there. And my health deteriorated really quickly, both my physical and my mental health. And I was in constant pain to the point where that fall, I couldn't get out of bed on my own. I couldn't roll over on my own, never mind run or train. And this is six months out of the Olympic trials. Finally, after a lot of work with some great resources, we discovered that I had an autoimmune condition. And I won't get into all the technical aspects of that, but essentially I have a condition that creates a huge amount of inflammation in my joints, specifically in my hips and my pelvis. And that's why I was in so much pain and discomfort and why I couldn't move very well. Once we figured out what was going on, I was able to move forward from that, but it was really slow. I'd lost months of training, I was in a really dark place mentally. I was very depressed. Um, and through the early stages of 2016, we slowly improved, but the, the rate of improvement was not fast enough. And after months of being on antidepressants and really trying hard to get my body back in shape, my coach at the time and I came to a really hard decision about a month and a half out of the Olympic trials that summer that we weren't going to keep pushing. We had done a lot of damage to my body and mentally, like I said, I was in a really difficult spot and we, again, I was really glad I had a coach with a long-term view. My coach said, I think we're going to do more damage than it's worth. And I don't think that we're going to get you where you need to be. And I think it's in your long-term benefit to stop your season, stop running and really figure out your physical and your mental health. And that was probably the most difficult decision of my, my athletic career. I had missed 2012 and here we were at 2016 and I wasn't even going to be at the trials. So I moved back to Toronto and that summer I didn't run a step and I watched the Olympics from my couch in Toronto. And I want to pause here for a second and just reflect back. So in high school, um, I was in high school in the early 2000s. I chose my locker number to be 2008 because I wanted to go to the 2008 Olympics. I would have been 21. And those games came and went. I was in university by then and it wasn't the right time. And then in 2012, I was 25 years old. I missed those games by one spot. In 2016, I withdrew from because of illness and I was 29. And over the, uh, the next four years, I really put all of my sights and my energy on 2020. I was going to be 33 years old and I thought this is probably my last shot to make my first Olympic team. And then the pandemic hit and the games are postponed. And we don't know if they're going to happen at all. And I got to a point then where I thought my Olympic dream is, is really slipping away and this might not happen for me. And I had to come to terms with that. And I would have, that would have been okay. I got to a point where that would have been okay. But in 2021, early 2021, I was really healthy. I was really fit. I'd had um, a couple of years then of good, consistent health and training. And I thought this is my last, my last shot. So on April 12th of 2021, last April, I packed up my suitcases 
and I left for Flagstaff, Arizona to go to an altitude training camp without any certainty of what was going to happen. I hadn't hit Olympic standard yet. I hadn't raced in 18 months. And because of the uh, two week quarantine, if you came across the border, I knew I couldn't come home um, or I would lose two weeks of training. So I was either packing up to be gone for four months and, and not come back till after Tokyo, or I was going to come home with the disappointment of my life, not having made yet another Olympic team. I put in the best training block of my life with um, fellow Athletics Ontario member, uh, Andrea Sakafian. And in May of last year, I finally hit Olympic standard in the 5,000 meter. I ran a 17 second personal best. I became one of only six women to break the 15 minute barrier in that event in Canada. And in June, I was named finally to my first Olympic team. And on July 30th, 2021, I stepped into the Tokyo Olympic Stadium after 25 years of waiting for that moment. So I know that's a lot and thank you for bearing with me on that, but I, I wanted to give context as to what it's taken to get here. And I think that there's um, some important things to keep in mind about what this means, what it means to have stuck with it for 25 years. And I get praised a lot. Oh, you really must have, you know, it must have taken a lot to stick with it. And it did. Um, I'll also say that I am very fortunate. I have some great support systems in my life. I have a really supportive family. I've had great coaches and I've had the means to be able to make this work. Um, and, and I know that everyone's journey is a little bit different. So this is just my experience. But when, again, when I was reflecting on what I thought was important to share with the, with the group, ultimately it was less about achieving that final ultimate goal of stepping into the Olympic stadium and more about the things I learned about myself, both as a person and an athlete to get me there. And that's what I'd like to move on to now. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I think there are four really strong pillars that allowed me to get to uh, this, this ultimate goal of the Olympics so many years after setting the initial goal. And the first is my physical health. So every athlete is going to experience an injury, but how we deal with those injuries and the things we do to prevent them are what I think have helped me maintain my longevity in the sport. So whenever injuries came up, I learned to work with a reputable resource right away. I worked with manual therapists and strength and conditioning coaches and folks who were really knowledgeable um, in my case about running. And if you're a thrower or a jumper, working with someone who knows your event group really, really well is super important. I learned to become a student of my body. And what I mean by that is I didn't go to school for human anatomy um, or any kind of science, but I learned to understand my systems, my circulatory system and my lymphatic system and my musculoskeletal system, because I wanted to be as empowered as I could be as an athlete to not only understand what it felt like when things went wrong, but also to get on that right away. And the caveat to the, the, uh, the slash there is pain versus discomfort. I think it's really important to understand that as athletes, if we want to achieve, we need to put ourselves through some physical discomfort. But as soon as that crosses over into pain, that's your body and your mind's way of saying something's wrong. We need to pull back or make a change. And I, I really learned the difference between pain and discomfort. And the third piece there with injury management and prevent, prevention is that rest is part of training, not separate from it. I had a, a, an American Olympian friend who said, the best thing I did for my running was not run more, but sleep more. So that rest piece is really, really important. And it's counterintuitive to those of us, especially I think who are really driven. And we think about, you know, that saying pain is weakness, leaving the body. I can't stand that. Um, but, but similar to that is that we really need to see rest as part of training, not separate from it. This next one is a big one and it's tough, but, um, and I struggled with this a lot and it's part of mental health as well, but developing positive body image and your approach to fueling. Food is your fuel. And it's what allows you to not only recover, but excel. And it took me a long time to, to work on this. And I, again, I had some great mental health resources, which I'll get to in a moment. But in some ways, I was lucky when I was younger growing up and potentially a little more easily influenced than I am now. I didn't have social media, so I didn't have this issue. But I want to remind everyone that social media isn't real life. What you see on Instagram, images are altered and people present the best sides of themselves. Don't compare yourself to others. 
what you see on the on on, on the internet is not uh, what you should be comparing yourself to. Um, and, and the flip side of that is, is trusting in science. I think one of the things that um, is really detrimental, especially to our young female athletes, although it applies to, to everyone, is that um, we often see images of athletes when they're at their peak performance at the, on the Olympic stage, at the world championship stage. And when you see those images, we have um, worked very closely with physiologists and nutritionists and dietitians to get our body composition to be a certain way. And we maintain that in a very calculated and highly monitored way for about four weeks of the year, which means the other 11 months of the year, we don't look the way we do on those start lines, nor should we, because it's not sustainable um, and it's, it's, it's completely unhealthy. So um, I, that's something I've really worked on and I'm, I'm an advocate for because I think that everybody is different, every need is different, but if we're trying to be, you know, highly tuned, fast race cars, then we need good fuel and we need a lot of it because we're burning through it. And lastly, there is that long-term approach to training and development. Um, so again, I had coaches that helped me with this. It was so hard for me to pull myself out of the 2016 Olympic trials, but I had a coach really give me good advice and say, we can't take shortcuts. We can't put your body and mind in a place that's too fragile and it's going to it's going to burn you out and you might not have a future in this sport. And I'm so glad it sounds weird. I'm so glad that it took me another five years to make my first Olympic team because I don't think that I would have had this longevity had I tried to push through that. Be patient and trust the process and work with coaches who support that. So the next one is the mental health. And again, I feel like mental health is an umbrella that has really um, sort of overarched my whole experience in sport and in life. And I will say there that life and sport are not separate. There are separate elements to it. And there's, there's, some, there's some piece of separation that's important. But really, what we experience in our daily lives can't help but influence who we are as athletes and our success or our shortcomings or our injuries and things like that. So I dealt, I've dealt with, I have dealt and continue to deal with anxiety and depression throughout my life. Um, and those things have gotten far more manageable for me. I feel a lot better on a regular basis than I did when I was younger. Um, and again, I think kudos to um, Athletics Ontario and many of our sports systems for encouraging open conversations and dialogue about mental health, because it's something that needs to be talked about more and destigmatized. But I sought out a lot of resources to help manage that. So I was in talk therapy for a long time. Um, I won't get into all the uh, specifics of this because it's quite technical, but I have over the last year done something called neurofeedback training, which frankly, I think is one of the key pillars to how I got to the Olympics, especially during the anxiety of the pandemic. And I will, after we're done, link um, an episode of the ShakeOut podcast, which I host and produce, where I actually had a really frank conversation with my therapist about what neurofeedback training is. So you can feel free to check that out. I've also worked with sports psychologists um, who you know, really help with the sport specific side of, the, of mental training. So working on things like positive visualization, race day prep and nerve management, no matter how often you do it, stepping into a 50,000 person stadium and towing a line and trying to be calm in that moment doesn't come naturally to any of us. So working with resources who can um, help you with those things is has been really, really um, helpful for me. And then I wrote vulnerability there because I think, again, we need to continue pushing these conversations with our friends, with our families, being open as much as we can, finding people who will listen to us and be positive uh, resources and sounding boards so that we can really be honest about what our needs are um, and find those who can support us through those needs. Again, I can't stress it enough. Mental health is physical health, is spiritual health, and I think it's, it's one of the pillars to performance. Kind of along those lines, Life balance is something that I've learned to um, appreciate more as I've gotten older, but I do a lot of things outside of sport. I have been in school, I work multiple jobs, um, I've really worked on my relationships and I've done a lot of sports system involvement. So I'm on the board with Athletics Canada, I do some coaching, I do some broadcast work within sport media. So those things really have not only helped me avoid burnout, but have given me structure and purpose when running isn't going well. Like I said, injury and illness and setbacks are inevitable. They're going to happen. How we deal with them is really important and minimizing them is also super important. But when they come up, 
when your identity, and I've been on this end of the spectrum true too, is fully bound up in your sport, it's really hard to um, see yourself as a, as a complete human and, and see your way out of those dark moments if you don't have other things that fulfill you. And the flip side of that is that having those things in my life helps me know when to narrow my focus onto my sport. So just like I said, there's, there's about a four week period of the year where I'm really, really um, kind of highly tuned physically um, and have a, you know, a certain body composition and things like that. I'm also pretty strict about my lifestyle and maybe those other things take a backseat because sport is, is the pinnacle. It's the most important thing in those moments. But then outside of that, if I'm in a rest period, or if you take an off season, having those things to go back to can provide uh, some really helpful balance that I believe has led to my longevity. And finally, I've left the most cliche slide for the last, but I think it is the most important. You got to love the sport. Now, that doesn't mean you have to love every aspect of it. I used to hate strength training. I've learned to love it. I don't know what the flip was, but I used to absolutely hate strength training. I used to hate stretching. It just felt like such a waste of time. So I, but I did it. I did those things because I knew that they were going to help me make me better, but I didn't love them. It doesn't mean you have to love every moment of it. You will have good days and bad days. But I think what the pandemic taught us, especially, is you have to figure out what you love about your sport and find ways to incorporate, the, incorporate those elements that you love as much as possible. I really like going for some solo runs. I like throwing on a podcast or, you know, just getting out by myself. But I also have found that if I try to do all my runs by myself, my motivation drops like crazy. So um, finding even just, you know, when it was safe with public health guidelines to find one person to go out for a run with on a regular basis, made the time go by faster. It was so much more enjoyable. I was more motivated. So I tried to find the things that I really love about sport and use those as much as possible. Progress is just a reminder. Progress is not linear. We like to think that we go straight up or maybe we go up and plateau and then go up again. Often it's not like that. You might plateau for a really long time. I didn't PB for four years and sometimes you even go down a little bit, but then you can have quite an increase if you're patient with it and if you're trusting the process. And again, the most cliche point of the most cliche slide is the journey is more important than the destination. And the last thing I'll share with you is that when I was on that Tokyo start line, when I walked into that stadium and mind you, it was a really weird Olympics. The stadium was almost empty. Our friends and family couldn't be there. It was not the Olympic experience that I had envisioned for 25 years. It was still an amazing experience. But what I realized was that I had spent two and a half decades preparing for this one moment on the global stage. And while it was amazing, what was far more important was that the Olympics were the goal that got me to learn more about myself and become a better version of myself again as an athlete and a person that I think could have been possible without that long-term pursuit of a singular goal. I've traveled to over 30 countries. I've met people from all over the world. I've pushed myself through barriers that I didn't think were possible. I've learned leadership skills. I've developed lifelong friendships. Almost all of my work is related to my sport. Um, I've gained the, all the confidence that I have because of that. And I've learned to um, really approach my physical and my, my mental health in different ways that are, uh, that have been life-changing. So um, it doesn't matter if your end goal is the Olympics or making it to OFSA or, you know, throwing a personal best, um, it, whatever your end goal is, is your own. But my encouragement to you is use that goal to fuel you day in and day out to do the things in your life that make you feel good and make you feel successful, whatever that means to you and however you define that. And if you do want to get in touch, please feel free to reach out um, K8BBeast on Instagram and Twitter, and you can feel free to email me as well. And like I said, I'll drop um, the link to the podcast, the Shakeout podcast with Canadian Running Magazine in the group chat. But um, thank you so much for listening. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those now. Uh, thanks so much, Kate. Gosh, that was great. I um, hopefully we'll have some uh, some questions come through in the chat. But whilst we wait for that, I thought I'd sort of touch on a couple of things that you mentioned um, throughout the presentation. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about, especially me coming from Australia and moving around quite a lot and, and traveling quite a lot for for athletics, but you you had a lot of changes. So you know you went out you went out west um, to to Vancouver, and then you went down to Duke. And then you came back. There was a lot of shifts and changes, and 
you mentioned that sort of period, I think it was after your first year at Duke when you really started to get quite down on yourself and it was a really sort of troubling time. Mm -hmm. I wonder how those big transitions, because I know there's a lot of athletes and you know, I think the gold standard for, you know, a 16 year old here in, in, in Canada is to like get good enough to go down, do what you did in the States. Right. And when I've seen athletes sort of do that in different contexts, sometimes they, they just love it. It's fantastic. You know, it's just, but it's so different. The energy is different. The expectation is different. The people are different. The coaches are different. Um, yeah. I, I wonder how your experience was with that and, and whether you see any kind of, I don't know, relationship between big transition, big life transitions and how your headspace was and how you felt about yourself and, and your mental health. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, my perspective on big change, because as you said, I've been through a lot of it, is that I think that there are great growth opportunities through big change. And there is also always um, somewhat of a risk. And I think it changes depending on the context, but somewhat of a risk that um, you can get away from your support system or from what feels familiar and comfortable. Um, and I think that that's probably a very individual question. I think for me, I if I can reflect back, for instance, I'm really glad that I went to Duke. I'm glad that I um, took that, that risk. And my, like I said, my Duke experience wasn't um, peachy from start to finish. Uh, I, I should have mentioned this in the mental health presentation part, but there were, if I'm being frank, there were, you know, days where I couldn't, in 2016, I couldn't get out of bed because of my physical health. Um, there were days at Duke when I couldn't get out of bed because of my mental health. And here I was on scholarship um, at a very prestigious university. Um, and, you know, I was captain of the team and I had a lot of expectation riding on me and I had so much shame because of that, that my mental health deteriorated significantly during periods of the time I was there. That being said, um, that wasn't my whole experience. And I was able to seek some, some resources on campus. And then I'll go back again to my coach and my program. I'm, I'm so glad that I was with the, the supportive team that I had because they really, I think, were ahead of the curve. What is that now? 15 years ago um, with, with mental health. So um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I regret any of the decisions I made with those changes. I think that you can't always see the progress and the growth and the learning while it's happening. And maybe that's a little bit of a takeaway here is that sometimes you have to experience, it's kind of like that discomfort versus pain physically. I think sometimes we have to experience friction in order to grow and to get better, but you can't always appreciate it for that in the moment. And I would say if you're in, in, a, in an uncomfortable situation with a big change or a, a big move, stick with that um, discomfort. Sorry, is that me beeping? Stick with that discomfort, stick it out for a little while, give it a shot, maybe try some, some different things um, to see if you can maybe alleviate some of that friction. But if it starts becoming painful, and I mean, pain is harder to quantify, I think when it's um, from a mental health perspective, but if something is really, really causing you distress and not working, and I'll give you an example, I ended up taking two separate mental health leaves, leaves of absence from, from my Duke experience. So I was there for five years instead of four because I recognized that I needed two different semesters off. Um, and that's something that I didn't talk about for a long time because I felt a lot of shame about that. I thought it was my fault, but I also realized, I think I had enough intuition and again, a very supportive family structure to help me understand that I needed a break. And I was then, I then was able to build up the fortitude and the courage to go back and try it again. And I was better equipped then with different tools and, and experiences, but I'm really glad I took those breaks. So I, I would encourage you, if you're going through a big transition or a big change and you have some excitement about it and you've prepared well for it, but you feel a little bit of that discomfort, stick with it for a while. And if it ends up becoming painful or unbearable or um, you know it's not right intuitively, I would say maybe, you know, make, make another change either back to what is familiar or something that feels more supportive. That's a, yeah, re really good answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark had a good question. He, uh, Fantastic presentation, Kate. Um, how would you convince teenage athletes to set their focus on longer term when their four school seasons can set them so short term in terms of their mindset, um, especially in light of what you just mentioned? How would you convince teenage athletes to set their focus on the longer term? Yeah, right. 
That's another great question. And I think that um, I can't speak as much to the field events, but certainly one of the challenges as a runner is that we're, we don't have an off season. You're, you're, you're a three season athlete. You're a year round competitor. I mean, especially when I was um, in the university system, our training camp started in early August. Then we raced all cross country till December. We got a two week break. We raced all indoors till March. We got a two week break and then we raced all outdoors. And then I came home and ran the Ontario club system through the summer. So it is really hard. Um, I think that convincing younger athletes to do that uh, comes, comes often from, this is why I felt it was important to share this presentation, because I think that when you see adult athletes who are experiencing success and have been in the sport for a long time and not only been successful, but also really enjoyed that, those are the lessons and the mentorship side um, that I think is really important to impart. I think that coaches play a big role in this too. And I think that coaches often, when they have highly motivated, highly successful, high achieving athletes, which many runners are, <laughs> Um, sometimes a coach's job, sometimes their only job is pull the reins back on your athlete. So I think it, um, if an athlete's really gung ho to get out there and race every weekend or, or have a full season, I mean, my coach preemptively redshirted, and that means giving you a, a season off where you can get that competitive season back at the end of your career. But he intentionally would redshirt the freshman cross country athletes so that they had the first full semester to come into the team, train with the team do all the training, but they didn't race. And that was so that they could get their feet under them. I mean, I was coming from another country. This is a time before cell phones, you know, it was a huge adjustment. Um, and I was, I really appreciated that. I appreciated that he intentionally registered athletes because he had the intuition to see ahead and say, you're going to get burnt out and that's not going to be healthy for you. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a multi-prong approach, I would say, but I would really encourage parents and coaches if they notice that high achieving aspect in their athletes and their kids, encourage them to pull back a little bit and, um, and use that long-term goal to motivate them to be, I want to be really good when I'm 25. I also want to be really good when I'm 15, but I need to get there incrementally. I hope that answers the question. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure thing, Mark. <laughs> um, you mentioned before, Kate, uh, you, your term was letting go, um, and it was around sort of uh, the, I think the 2016 games um, that you did, made the decision, the really tough decision to pull out of. And, I mean, most athletes that are even trying to get to a trial, let alone Olympic Games, are really driven in what they do. And we have to be really driven as athletes to do that. Can you speak a little bit more to maybe, you know, that experience of, of letting go in that environment, but also other times where, you know, maybe it just didn't feel right, whether it was a mental thing or a physical thing, but because I feel like it's a really important skill for an athlete to have is to just step back and, and let things go. And I think the red shirting example is a good sort of forethought to that, but I'd love to hear more on that experience and maybe others that you've had through your career. Sure. Yeah. And I'll, I'll equate that back again to kind of becoming a student of your body. Like I said, in, in the physical health piece, I think that equally to that or possibly more important is um, becoming a student of, of what feels right and, and learning to trust your intuition. Um, again, I've, I've been so fortunate to have extraordinary coaches who have really encouraged this. So I, that's been a gift. And I think that I started at, a, you know, I had a leg up because of that. But um, I, I got really good at, at saying to my coach and having them trust and respect me when I said, when I would turn up to practice and I had had a really crappy week. And that could mean a lot of things. It could mean that I was really stressed out because I had too many projects going on at school. It could just mean that um, for whatever reason, I, my mental health had really suffered that week and I wasn't motivated and I was feeling highly anxious and I didn't feel capable of exerting the output that I knew would be necessary to accomplish the goal of, of the workout or the race. And I learned over time um, and again, was encouraged by these wonderful mentors and role models in my life to say, it doesn't feel right today. So I, I keep going back to this, but it's that pain versus discomfort. If you're a little, if you're nervous or if you're unsure, or maybe you're a little stressed and that can mean different things for different people, maybe it's worth it to try, try the workout. Um, see, cause you, cause I've also had equal, uh, experiences where I surprise myself and then I, and then that snowballs in a really great direction. Cause then I feel like I've overcome and I feel really good about that. 
but I think that um, there are some days where I've, I've, I've just turned up or I've called my coach and I said, it's not, it, today is not the right day. Here's what I'm going to do to seek the support I need and to support myself. And let's come back and try this again tomorrow. And again, I think that more often than not with high achievers and with athletes who have made it to a certain level where they've stuck with it and they've overcome and they've persevered, whether that be in middle school, high school, the collegiate level, whatever, those athletes aren't, aren't for lack of a better word, wimps, right? Like they're not just trying to avoid hard work. Um, I, I think that um, it, it's, it's learning that and learning to trust it and being encouraged to trust that by the adults in our lives and the mentors and the, the people who are equally part of our um, seeking for excellence. Um, excellence. Excellence involves failing a lot. And it also involves Sometimes excellence means, like I said, not sh showing up for the workout because you know it's not the right thing that day. Um, and, and I always had that longer term goal in mind. And, and then I really, I trusted my coach when he said in 2016, and I was also exhausted. That's the other reality. I mean, this was a really, really exhausting year. I had just been through both physically and mentally to have to force yourself to get up every day. And by up, I mean, like get that energy and, and the fire burning because I was encountering physical and mental barriers. I was so tired um, that I, I finally had someone validate that for me and say, it's up to you, but I don't think you should do this. And I think it took that for me to say, you're right. I'm so tired. Thank you for giving me that permission. I'm really glad you, um, you touched on the mentor. Cause that was something I wanted to ask you about was cause you mentioned your, your mentors a few times and, and the amazing uh, family and support you had for your family. Um, I'd like to hear more about who you had as mentors. I mean, obviously your coach usually has a mentoring role, but sort of outside that, the ones, the people that maybe you didn't expect and did you seek them? Did it just sort of happen via osmosis? What was your experience mm. with having really good support sort of you know, maybe through peers or through um, older people that weren't, weren't athletes? Yeah, great question. I think inevitably I was, um, I always had that, that cohort that were peers, but a few years older, right? So when I was in grade nine and 10, I had the, the 12s. And again, I'm dating myself, the OAC athletes to look up to. Um, and then in college, it was the same thing. And that again, was part of how I selected my university program was what, what did the athletes have to say? What did the leadership structure look like on the team? How much accountability and responsibility did the coaches give the older athletes to help mentor the younger ones? That was, I mean, these were, again, kudos to my parents, but these were questions that we asked of the programs I was applying to. Um, when I made those junior national teams, you know, I made two world junior cross country championships. I made a, a Pan Am juniors. There were almost always um, older athletes. So they, they were often integrated, the senior and the junior teams. So for instance, I made uh, the, the NACAC cross country championships in 2004 or 2005 and Megan Metcalf Wright and Hillary Stellingworth and Carmen Duma Hussar. And I, I mean, the younger athletes won't know who these women are, but these were women who I had looked up to for years. Um, and they were the senior athletes while I was a junior. And I think Athletics Canada did a really good job at that time of integrating those older athletes with the younger ones. Um, and, and I feel very fortunate to have had those, which is why I now really seek opportunities to share some of the wisdom that I've learned over the years with, with younger athletes as well. Um, but I, I think mentor mentoring and, and knowledge sharing and experience sharing is just, it can't, the, the value can't be overstated. Um, and I, yeah, it, it's something that I would encourage all older athletes to do. And then I started seeing that in my peers as well. And so when I, when I use that word vulnerability on the mental health slide, I think part of it was that I really let my walls down over time with my competitors who were also my peers. So I have a lot of um, female mid-distance friends, both in Canada and the States, who when I go to races with them, we're best friends until the gun goes off. And then we're competitors. And then when we cross the line, we're hugging each other and high-fiving each other and supporting each other through the loss of parents or the birth of children. And I think that seeking, um, positive influ influences in your peers and seeing them both like learning how to be competitive at the right time and le then learning how to be really supportive outside of that has been hugely helpful for me. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's it, yeah. I, I think it's a, a super important aspect of, of any athletes sort of developing is, you know, having that good support network and having good people around them, whether it be a coach or a, a, someone completely outside the sport can, can also play a really good, strong role as a mentor. Um, 
you mentioned your your propensity to being anxious and having anxiety and I think especially in the the distant community it's probably a slightly higher prevalence <laughs> lots of a types in there um what are some of the day-to-day things that, that you maybe changed throughout your career, uh, especially when things weren't going as well as you'd like and you were really feeling that anxiety? Some day-to-day things that helped you sort of, you know, and it's not going to go away. That's one thing that I've certainly learned is it doesn't go away. You just sort of have to accept it and manage it in a certain way. So what were some of the things that you've done to, to manage your anxiety? Talked about it more. Um and, you know, again, it, it sounds simple. I know it's really hard to do in practice. I, I recognize that. But, um, and this is for social media. I, I talked about the perils, but this can also be a tool, right? And I think the connectivity, the power of connectivity there can, can be great. Um, I, start, I, I felt so much shame about my, my anxiety on a regular basis that I didn't talk about it. And then it compounded. And so it took me a long time to seek resources and to seek help. And I'll, I'll say, I come from a family of two mental health professionals. My parents both have social work backgrounds. And again, they were hugely supportive, but even in a family that knowledgeable and supportive, I've still really struggled. So I just wanna normalize that it can happen to everyone and it can impact people very differently, but um, everyone's experience with it is valid. I mean, there, there were some small day-to-day things like, um, like journaling. And so when I, t- when I say talk about it, it started with just talking about it to myself because I didn't even want to acknowledge it to myself. I didn't want to acknowledge that perceived weakness. So writing about it really honestly and journaling and and being able to um, have that outlet Um, and then starting to talk about it with those who are close to me and then seeking out, you know, again, um, some mental health professionals and then talking about it really openly on on social media is something that I've been committed to more recently Um, and, and acknowledging that those things will ebb and flow but that they're not invalidating um, and that they, the more we talk about it, the more we see the commonality and the more we can be supportive of one another. But, but journaling, um, doing some meditative practices, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, sleep work. So um, making sure that I'm not on the screen before bedtime. Um, I, I listen to um, like frequency music. You can look it up on YouTube, but it, it kind of taps into different frequencies in your brain and it helps bring your nervous system down. Um, one thing I will say quickly about the neurofeedback training that I did is that the concept of neurofeedback training ultimately is that it helps tap into the nervous system to teach it how to be on when it needs to be on and off when it needs to be off. And what I realized ultimately was that my anxiety on a regular basis had so much to do with my nervous system just being jacked up all the time, which then had a parallel physical effect of not recovering. And the more that I can learn to bring that recovery down um, in tandem physically and mentally through some of this, uh, uh, yeah, this nervous system work, it just, it made a huge difference for me. Um, there are some physical things. Again, if you want to reach out to me, I've got, there's some foam roller techniques where you can lie on the foam roller and tap into some different parts of the body that will create sort of a relaxation effect. But um, I would say talking about it and then doing the neurofeedback training were the, the two biggest things that really helped me. And just, and being non-judgmental, hardest thing to do, but just saying, okay, I'm feeling anxious or I'm having a rough week. And that's, I, I, I want, I want to be solution oriented about this but that doesn't make me lesser. And it, it's just part of my reality right now. So let's find a way to be supportive with it. You've just opened up a, a box of things that I could talk about with you for probably <laughs> another two hours. Um, and uh, I'm really glad you mentioned journaling because it, it was one of my things that I was going to ask you about. And, and certainly with the athletes that I've worked with and myself included, um, journaling was such an important part of, of the process. And yeah, sometimes you don't want to, but sometimes they're the best days to do that kind of thing. You know, if anyone wants to start journaling um, in a more sort of touchy feely way and it feels uncomfortable, one thing that really helped me as a, as a starting point was I keep a training log and it's pretty numbers based, right? So I write down either how many minutes or how many kilometers I ran that day. If I did a workout, I write down all the intervals I did. Um, I write down how many hours I slept that day. And if I had treatment and if I going to say it, if I got my period, I mean, these things are all really important to track, but I started writing down some of the feeling statements into my training journal, because that felt like a natural way to see the physical and the mental as being supportive of each other. So I started with a really simple technique of every day in my training log, I would write down either a smiley face, a frowny face, or like a neutral face, like with the straight line. And that was the first step. 
And then from there, it built into, let me put down some feelings that were associated with that, or what else was going on in my life that day that might have contributed to it. But I think that if, if you're looking to start journaling and you don't know where to start or it feels overwhelming, build it into a simple training log and, and see where it goes from there and see what feels comfortable. That's a, a, yeah, a great point. I think that it marries what you mentioned earlier on about um, you being you as an athlete and that being separate from you as a person. And I okay. think that that does tend to bridge the gap a little bit and make you more of a complete human. Um, totally. right, I'll, I'll give you one, qu one more question. This is a great question from Sahid. Um, uh, if you go back and speak to a younger Kate, or let's, let's just say a younger, you know, you that's coming through the ranks at the moment, anyone who's younger than you, who's maybe going through some of the things you did, um, what, uh, what's one piece of advice you would share with, with you or with them? Oh, Sahid, you're killing me. That's a big one. Um, I only mean, one, so, only one. It's, yeah, yeah. Only <laughs> one. Just, just choose the, the, the most poignant one. That that's, that's, that's a very difficult question. Thank you for that challenge. Hmm. I, I would say I would, I, I wish I had started trusting myself earlier, I think. And it goes back to this holistic approach to my, my athletics that I mentioned before. I wish I had learned to listen to the little tweaks in my body that I knew weren't quite right and get on them right away in terms of, oh, I, I really need to, you know, pay more attention with my trigger point ball to that specific calf area, or um, I need to trust my trust that the training is going to build and pay off in this race. Or I, I need to trust that when I tell, when I'm not, when I'm feeling off about something, I need to listen to that. Or when I'm, when I'm feeling like it's time to really surge in this workout or this race that I, I can do that. Some of those things you, you can't help but develop over time, right? But it's trial and error. And I think I wish I had taken some more of those small trial and error risks when I was younger um, to develop that intuition at a slightly younger age and really learn to trust myself. I've, I've learned to trust myself really well now as, as an adult in my mid thirties, but um, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of ways to, you know, if, if coaching were simple and there were only three training plans for everyone, we would have figured it out by now, but every athlete is different and every individual is different. Um, and tuning out some of that noise and really learning to, to trust myself when I was younger, I think would have been, uh, would have been beneficial, but maybe I wouldn't have learned as much. So I, I don't have a, a, a very good answer for this. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, a lovely, uh, a lovely point to finish on. Um, Kate, thank you so much. Um, you're thank you. you're such a, a, a wonderful force in the community here and yeah. you do so much for the athletes and, uh, and I mean, you're still competing, but you, you're doing what you said you were going to do, which is start giving back. And you definitely have been doing that for a long time. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you for talking about, I think, sometimes an uncomfortable subject. So I really appreciate you being on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And again, anyone who, please, if you want to get in contact, reach out to me on social or uh, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm always more than happy to chat with uh, with anyone and everyone. So thank you again and good luck, everyone. Awesome. And don't forget to I put have... any, any more stuff on the, uh, in the chat there of your, your contacts. I know so he put the, uh, the podcast link there, but... Anything else, please, please put in there. For Great. See. And I'm so sorry. I have another talk to get to, so I'm going to have to jump off, but I promise I'll, I'll watch the second half of this presentation <laughs> afterwards. No worries. Uh, again, appreciate it. And, and good luck, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Okay. We are going to shift things up a little bit. Uh, we've got our next speaker coming in. Um, so Natasha McLaughlin Chason, I think that's right for your surname. Natasha. Yes, that's right. Yes, nailed it. Um, so Natasha comes from us from New, Dr New Brunswick, and she is the owner of NMC Nutrition. She's a nutritionist. Um, she's been working in high-level sport for 15 years. You've worked with NHL players. You've worked with Canada hockey. You've worked with uh, some para sports. You've worked with Canada cycling. Um, a really, really big array of sport. And I didn't know about this, but this uh, diploma is sports nutrition, which is apparently very highly regarded. Um, you, uh, you have that as well. And you're really, uh, your experience is, is just really wide and wonderful. And we're really excited to hear you speak um, some truths about nutrition. I do like your, uh, your sign off on your email. It's nutrition is a science, not an opinion. <laughs> And it is, it is. So, so thank hopefully you so we'll much. cover some of those things tonight and I will, uh, I'll pass it over to you. So thank you so much, Natasha. I appreciate uh, being here, Brandon. And, and I want to thank Kate too. It, it was just great listening. Uh, I don't know if she's still on there, but uh, listening to her speak and it's just uh, speaking 
you know, from experience. And I think so many athletes could benefit from hearing her talk. She just talks so well as well. And uh, yeah, it was really, really good uh, session. So I'm going to do a quick screen share here. And I want to tell you all, I apologize in advance. I want to be transparent, but I may move a bit. I had, I've been given uh, a quick reschedule from, uh, I was supposed to get PRP injections two months ago. And then because of COVID, they'd been rescheduled. And so I got them just recently. And so I'm in quite a bit of pain. So I might have to move around at their um, plasma rich uh, platelets in my back uh, and in my hips. But uh, yeah, I might, I might move around a bit, but otherwise uh, <laughs> I should be good to go. So let me do a screen share here. There we are. All right. So first thing um, I would like to do is just know who we have here in terms of sports and disciplines. So if, if um, that could be, I don't even know if I'd be able to see the chat box, maybe in the group chat, uh, y'all can share the groups, uh, the, the, the disciplines and the sports. I know this will be watched later on as well, but um, just out of curiosity, if we've got representation from, from every discipline, um, you know, coach, athlete, uh, even parents participating, just so I could get a good feel. There we go, chat's lighting up. Coach and athlete track, okay, sprinter, wonderful, welcome, official, wonderful. We've got some officials, that's fantastic. Middle Distance University, okay. Wonderful, so feel free to keep writing them in there. Um, like I said, uh, my focus is really to personalize the session to you. We're gonna talk about sports nutrition. Uh, we've clearly got a good array of uh, athletes here from different disciplines, um, but also from officials to coaches to athletes, Parasprinter, Hudson Parasprinter, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Hudson. So um, what I want us to focus on is I want you to really make this session your own, okay? I want you to ask as many questions as you need to, to make this session valuable to you. I don't want you to feel like if you've lost an hour of your lives, your, your, your time is so valuable and limited as athletes um, and, and coaches and officials, and, and you've got this very um, vibrant life on the side. So make sure to ask your questions throughout the session. Okay. Um, now, before we keep going, we've got a poll that we're going to do to get you, uh, get your, your brains going a little bit and to, to get you maybe thinking and uh, testing. We want to just see where your knowledge lies uh, in terms of some of the information we'll be discussing today. So, um, Brandon, if you don't mind sharing, uh, beautiful. So I'm going to go through the questions. Feel free to answer them at your own pace. Um, first off, hydration, so drinking enough liquids affects power output. Is that true or false? Go ahead and answer. Um, this, the answers will just all show up in, in sort of a, a general poll. So we're not, we won't be picking anybody out because they've got the wrong answer. So don't worry about that. Um, how long does it take after consumption for a sip of liquid to begin hydrating your body? 10 seconds, five minutes, 20 minutes, or 40 minutes. What's your guess? Uh, the next question, what is the best fuel to consume one hour before training session? So these are examples of what you could consume. I'm wondering what you think the best option would be. Would it be eggs and bacon? Would it be just protein powder, maybe mixed in water? Uh, would that be toast and jam or peanut butter? Um, and oh, banana, that should be banana, my apologies, but peanut butter and banana sandwich. Um, the next question, you should eat your recovery meal within how many minutes after training? Five minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, two hours. So pick your, your choice there as well. And finally, your recovery meal should consist of, should it be carbs and protein, carbs alone, protein alone, or should it be green vegetables with a source of protein? 
So go ahead and answer if you haven't answered yet, just so we can see where the, those uh, answers lie and those percentages lie. Okay, we've got three more to answer. Beautiful. I'd answer on my end, but I don't want to uh, skew, <laughs> skew the results. I think, I think we have everyone who's going to answer answered. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll end, oh no, last one has just come through. Okay, I'll, I'll end up, oh, no, here we go, okay. <laughs> So you didn't so, answer, obviously. So I think we're, everyone's answered now. Beautiful. So if you don't mind maybe sharing us, uh, there we go. So good job for number one. Everyone got it right. <laughs> Beautiful to see. Uh, number two, how long does it take after consumption for a sip of liquid to begin hydrating the body? Very interesting that there's so much variety in answers here. The answer is actually 40 to 60 minutes. So we're going to talk about this in the session as well. But if you're going into a practice or, or a training session and you are starting to drink liquid at that time or on the drive there, depending on how, you know, how long the drive there is, um, it may be too late for you to benefit from that hydration if you are dehydrated at that time. So we will touch base on that again. Uh, the best fuel to consume an hour before training. So we'll go through that as well. But the answer here would have been the peanut butter plus banana sandwich. Okay, so the peanut butter and banana sandwich, so that we are getting some carbs and protein, but we're not getting excessive amounts of protein. I'll talk about that in the session as well. Okay. Um, and so we'll go through the other options in the session as well. So recovery meal um, should be five minutes, 20 minutes and one hour are all good answers. Two hours, you are waiting too long and you do have a risk for muscle wasting. So your body to sort of break away at your muscles. So we do want to be within that hour range. And here carbs and protein would actually be the right answer for your recovery meal. Um, if we're looking at the green vegetables and protein, the issue there is we're not rejuvenating that, that gas tank if your body was a vehicle the carbs would be the the fuel in the gas tank and so in that case your body can't use the protein properly and again i'm going to go into so much detail with each of these answers but it's good to see where you lie and i will ask all of these questions again um, most likely towards the end so we can see uh how you would answer differently at that time so just to mention um i did uh I am francophone, so I did study at Université de Moncton for my bachelor's degree before I did my specialization through the International Olympic Committee, uh, my two-year specialization. So if anyone's more comfortable asking their questions in French, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français aussi. All right. So um, there's my, my quote that I think... Uh, Brendan and I both uh, agree on that nutrition is a science, not an opinion, um, or my motto, I should say, or whatever, whatever that that word is in English. Um, it's about training smart today. So I want to teach you all how to get the most out of your training. You most likely all know at your level how to um, push yourself and how to train hard. But as Kate had even mentioned, um, training smart plays a role getting the proper sleep in there and of course getting nutrition in there as well I'm not expecting perfection from any of you um and so as I've seen obviously and as I know uh with these types of endurance sports individual sports athletics in general a lot of perfectionists it does not have to be black and white with nutrition all foods fit we're talking about food that are everyday foods and the sometimes foods and the sometimes foods I'll often call it food for the soul as well, right? Because we've got to remember that there is the fueling component, but there's also that um, emotional component, the component of the, the food we grew up on or the food that um, we enjoy sharing with friends and family. So getting that type of food in there as well is not, uh, not something that I'm going to be telling you to focus on eliminating completely. Okay. We really got to get that um, out of our mind, that black and white with good food and bad food that doesn't exist. Okay. We're not going to call it a cheat. There's nothing negative about it. Um, but we're going to talk about how you should be eating about, you know, closer to your training sessions about 90% of the time. 
So questions about food, liquid supplements, we're going to address it today. Now, biggest nutritional um, issues causing decline in performance in athletics would generally be a lack of fuel or a dehydration. And because you're training year round, because um, you are not getting much recovery time from day to day, this can cause issues. And so there was a 2018 study done on the knowledge of athletic trainers, collegiate athletic trainers about relative energy deficiency in sport. And what was really interesting was that only about 33% of participants were aware of what REDS actually is. So does anyone want to write in that chat box if you know what REDS is, um, what it, you know, what it means, relative energy deficiency in sport or what the definition is? Anyone want to give that a try? Oh, beautiful. Not having enough calories. That's pretty much it. So um, if we look here, what it is, is, oh, there we go. If you're, you've got a calorie deficit that is caused by um, not consuming enough calories in your day based on your energy expenditure. Okay. So you may be eating three times more than your family members who may be quite a bit more sedentary than you are, but if you're not eating enough for your output, if the gap is too wide, what ends up happening is it affects all the systems in the body. Okay. So who can this affect? And I see this in athletics quite often. And this is why I'm starting by mentioning this. So athletes wanting to lose weight or to stay lean, lose body fat, um, I'll see this quite considerably where they will cut out too much food and then performance starts to decline. And we'll talk about that in a second. Those with a low appetite as well. Um, sometimes after training, if, if you've trained really, really hard, um, they call it here, the, the, a lot of the uh, athletics athletes here will call that the Tuesday night training. I don't know if it's the same for some of you uh, at your universities uh, and so on, but, uh, and even high schools, but the Tuesday night training is quite difficult. Um, so sometimes you might have nausea or lack of appetite for a couple hours after. And if you give into that and you don't fuel in a different way, such as by liquids, smoothies, things like that, then that lack of calories on a day-to-day -day can actually um, lead to reds if it's, you're really under uh, fueling. Sometimes it could just be because you have so many uh, trainings, practices, and races, and so much output of energy on top of maybe if you're in high school, you've got a phys ed class, or maybe on top of that, um, you are going through puberty. So needing more calories that way. On the other side of the, the, uh, the, la medaille, the, the other side, can't say of the metal. Anyways, on the other side of it, um, the risk sometimes comes from the fact that you're so back to back with maybe classes and running to work and then running to, to see, you know, a friend and, projects and training that you might skip snacks or meals because you didn't bring anything with you. Um, and then those with iron deficiency can actually have a lack of appetite that makes them not want to eat the amount of calories that they're necessarily needing. Okay. So this used to be called way back. We call it the female athlete triad because we thought it only affected, um, the, uh, gender assigned female uh, at birth. So this used to be, uh, first off, a lack of menstrual period. So not having the menstrual period or the menstrual period being uh, irregular. And this was due to an estrogen decline or, or a hormone being affected, which would then affect bone health. Okay. And in a lot of instances, we thought it was normal for uh, female uh, at birth assign genders to not have menstrual periods if they were high performance athletes. And now we know that's not the case. It's not normal. It's not a good thing. Okay. But now we realize that it affects, um, the gender, uh, at birth assigned males as well. So this would mean that we can see a huge testosterone drop. Um, if you're not having these, uh, the, the sufficient amount of calories as well. And this affects all these systems, as you can see here from the cardiovascular system being affected to the psychological, uh, side of it, growth and development, puberty can be, um, pushed back. So puberty is not happening when it's supposed to, where growth and development, we might not be seeing, um, 
gains in training because of that lack of calories. And then of course, from a performance standpoint, um, we've got this great graph here showing um, that it can affect injury risk. Uh, we're talking about especially um, stress fractures, bone injuries, but also just from uh, decreased coordination, increased risk for injury because of uh, technical uh, abilities being off and things like that, reaction time and such. So I'm not going to go into much detail more than this, but the point of it is if you are having some of these symptoms or if you're noticing uh, as, as officials, as coaches, uh, even as athletes, if you're noticing a teammate who may be uh, suffering from a lot of these symptoms. So obviously if it's chronic fatigue, maybe it's just a sleep issue, maybe, um, you know, is something like depression could have other causes. But if you've got a lot of these on the list that you're checking off these red flags, definitely something to discuss with your coaches, to discuss with your uh, sports physician, sports dietitian, um, so that you can make sure that you're not under fueling for the amount of energy you're putting out. So I want to talk about how to reduce the risk, the risk of reds. So the first thing we're going to pay attention to mm -hmm is sorry but that is um this is not um a graph that is exactly scaled but this is what i want to show you as a bigger picture if we're looking at uh, the di different types of uh, macronutrients that you're putting into your body and how you're actually utilizing them. And this goes back to one of those first questions in the poll with what to consume before and in recovery from training. I'm seeing that we've got some athletes who may not be aware of how these different types of macronutrients work in the body. So I'm going to start with simple carbs because that was one of the answers that I uh, had seen. So here we're talking about white bread, white pasta, white rice, um, and fruit. Okay. So let's say you are to have carbohydrates by itself. You will have a quick energy, as you can see here in that uh, light blue line going right up the energy. Uh, this is like the gas in the gas tank. If your body was a vehicle, that's not going to last very long. Okay. Because it is a simple carb. It'll give you a quick energy, but within about an hour after that, and it could be a little longer, a little, uh, shorter, depending on the individual, um, the gas tank will empty. And when the gas tank empties, um, this can bring trouble focusing, trouble concentrating, fatigue, irritability. Um, and there is one study that I had read recently that actually showed that there could be a decline in speed by up to about uh, 16 to 17%. Now, when you see this very high peak, um, and then this crash, this high peak can increase inflammation as well. Okay. So if we're having this multiple times a day, you're at work, you're in class, you're having just a banana or just an apple for snack. Um, then the issue becomes there is an increase in inflammation, which if you have an injury is not ideal. And if you are recovering, of course, we need some inflammation for training adaptation to occur. But if we've got too much inflammation, that's slowing down things as well. Okay. Now, if you are having complex carbs, so this could be um, oatmeal, it could be whole grain bread, it could be quinoa, um, a whole wheat couscous or whole wheat pasta. Now this energy is going to last a little bit longer because there's more fiber, but again, it will drop. Now, when we've got the protein and fat, let's think of cheese or, or, or nuts. There's both protein and fat in there. As you can see, it takes a little longer before you have access to that fuel. And that fuel is not going to give you as high of um, a performance ability. Okay. If you're fueling only with that. So the performance sort of peak is not as high. And in athletics, we're looking for a quick fuel. We're looking for a high intensity uh, fuel or higher intensity than if you were doing, let's say, um, a hiking where you might be more of a zone one zone, mostly zone two, um, and maybe fueling a little bit more on fat. So what is the ideal combination? Um, and why am I even talking about how you're eating in class or how you're eating at work? And that's because recovery occurs for a good 48 hours and even longer or 24, sorry, to 48 hours after each training session. So it's not only directly after the training session that counts, but it's how do you eat and how do you drink from session to session? Okay. So the ideal way of eating is to combine these. So instead of just having the apple, let's say at a snack, maybe we're going to have that apple and combine 
uh, cheese with it. And we might even have some crackers with that. And instead of just having the banana, we might have a handful of nuts or nut butter, peanut butter. Um, and we could add maybe a granola bar if we wanted to, if we needed that extra fuel. Okay. So this is called the athlete's plate and it's been around for a good 10 years, uh, maybe even longer developed by the U S Olympic committee. And it's a really good resource. Um, but you'll, I'm going to show you in terms of athletics in general and, and the, the disciplines that you'd mentioned, you're mostly all focused on requiring more fuel than that basic plate, which would often be, you know, the food guide plate that we see as well um, in public health and in dietitians who work with public health and schools and that type of thing. That would not be enough fuel for you as athletes. So if we're looking at this plate, this plate is divided in a way that you're getting about 0.3 grams of protein per kilo body weight. So for most of you, we'd be looking at anywhere from a maybe 20 to 25 grams of protein. And then we're having about a two to one carb to protein ratio if we're looking at this plate particularly. So this plate could be maybe if you have one training session a day that's not too, too heavy, maybe you would train an hour and then you have an hour of flexibility work um, or maybe a technical type of work that is not going to be um, putting out as much energy, okay? Now, I wanna remind you, this is the plate you put in front of you when it's time to eat and you're putting this plate in front of you or these three combinations about every three hours throughout the day. So snacks are not just for the little kids. Snacks are for everyone. Now you're putting this plate in front of you, but then you should be able to trust your body to help guide you into how much you actually need to be consuming. So on some days, you may need to go back for seconds, whereas on other days, you might not feel the need to finish your plate. And that's the side of it that you've got to trust your body to do. And some, some athletes will tell me, listen, I can't trust my body because I want to eat a hole through the wall. And you've got to remember, if you don't have enough protein, or maybe if you didn't earlier on in the day uh, have breakfast or you skipped a snack, then this will cause you to have a harder time following your appetite or trusting your appetite. So we've got our whole grains here and our fruit. This would be our gas in the gas tank. That's the fuel. Now the protein is the energy stabilizer that helps the fuel last a longer time instead of spiking and crashing. The protein, that's the eggs, that's the nuts, the chickpeas, uh, the fish, the cheese, the Greek yogurt, okay? And then we've got our vegetables and the fruit and vegetables gives us antioxidants. So a lot of different colors and every color gives different types of antioxidants to help with training adaptation. So when I'm talking about training adaptation, it's if you were to look at your muscles, even under a microscope, we'd want um, a scientist to be able to say, okay, I can tell which sport this athlete's in, which discipline, which level, because of the, the, the development of the mitochondria and the cells and the fast twitch and the slow twitch fibers and so on. And what helps our body adapt from one training session to the next um, is a lot of the vitamins and minerals we consume as well. So the different colors can help and, and that's always a good thing to be consuming. Now, before I show you the next plate here, I want to remind you about periodization. So does anyone know the term periodization? I know uh, coaches use it quite a bit. Maybe uh, if any of the athletes know what the term periodization means. Anyone? Okay, so periodization is when you are adapting um, in terms of nutrition is when you're adapting the nutrition to the training that day or to the practices or to the output that day. So you're not going to train the same all season long, all year round because um, you're a distance runner or because you are a sprinter. Um, so what we need to remember is we're going to adapt our plate based on what we're doing that day. Um, we're going to eat differently, maybe on a day where we train more versus day we train less. And even during that day, we can adapt differently. So in terms of adaptation, if you're training a higher training session, a harder training session, or maybe you're training a little bit less 
um, on one session, but you're doing a double session that day, uh, then your plate may need more fuel. And you think of it as, again, if you're body is a vehicle and you're going on a road trip, you need more gas in that gas tank. Okay. So here we would see maybe more of a three to one carb to protein ratio. It could go higher as well. Um, but we're always going to focus on getting the proper protein amounts, um, the fruit and vegetables, and then the grains there. And you can see there's liquid. The fat is always consumed, always a good thing uh, to add here and there as well. Um, but the priority is really to have the three groups. Now, if you have an early training session in the morning, you definitely get, have to give yourself time to digest. So this would be about a three hour before a hard training session or a hard practice. And I'm not expecting you to get up at 4 a.m., that's the case if you're doing something in the morning you might go with just more of the carbs um, and a little less protein we're going to reduce the protein by about half if you're training maybe an hour an hour and a half beforehand uh sorry after your meal and if you wake up and you're you know going right away uh for a run or anything like that or going to the gym to lift weights then you might just have an applesauce or a banana or something that simple okay how are we doing so far? Any questions? We're good. See thumbs up. Okay. So I want to mention protein powder because I always get that question. I talk protein, protein, protein. And then the first question I get is, well, what about protein powder? Oh, right here. Okay. Got a question. Uh, the amount of protein per meal. Yes. So that's about 0 0.3 grams per kilo that you weigh. So in general, if you weigh, um, if you take your weight in pounds and you divide it by 2.2 and then multiply that by 0 0.3, it'll give you that range, which for most of you will be anywhere from maybe, maybe like a 15 to 25 grams of protein. Um, we generally say 20 as a, as a, guideline. Um, this is assuming that you're, yes, it's if you assume that you're having six meals, honestly, a day, so three meals and three snacks, because you are expected to have protein at your snacks as well. If it's not realistic. I mean, in society, in our society, we have a habit of eating bigger meals and smaller snacks. You can have maybe 30 grams of protein at meals and maybe 12 grams of protein at snacks, but we just need to make sure that our ratios are proper and our combinations are proper in order for to not burn muscle. Because if we burn through the fuel too quick, we tend to think that's okay. My body will burn fat, but the body will burn your mu muscle mass as well as your fat. And so we don't want to be taking two steps forward by training hard. And then one step back because we're allowing our body to burn our muscle. Quick follow-up question on that, Natasha. Um, yes. Is there a limit to how much protein can be absorbed sort of in, in one meal? Yes. So generally, again, um, the literature suggests about a 0.3 to a 0.5 grams per kilo um, at a meal. And other than that, I mean, if we're having large amounts and I've seen athletes having like a 60 grams of protein thinking they're doing themselves justice, but you will be urinating that out for the rest of it. So it's really getting that balance in. And if your meals are that large, instead, maybe spread it out and have, you know, half of it three hours later. So you can actually benefit from that protein? So that's a very good question. So in terms of protein powder, you've probably all done your uh, courses on doping and so on. Um, but I want to mention real food first. I always suggest real food first because there is more vitamin mineral bioavailability. So your ability to absorb and use vitamins and minerals is going to be greater from the real food. Um, you're not going to see studies show you're not going to see more benefit with a protein powder than with real food. The reason protein powder is so popular is just because it's an easy grab. So if you are having it, I'll say no more than once a day. I've had especially university athletes who are out on their own and it just gets so overwhelming trying to cook and do everything that they were having, you know, protein powder four or five times a day instead of food. And then they develop uh, these deficiencies in vitamins and minerals that we're not used to testing for, but it's because they were just choosing the protein powder instead of the real food. Okay. So we definitely want to make sure that if you 
choose a protein powder. It is certified NSF or informed sport. Very, very important. Um, both these certifications are international certifications and studies show, uh, and in the literature, you'll see there's up to a 10 to 20 percent risk of testing positive for doping um, with a protein powder that is not certified NSF or informed sport. And of course, um, you've even got risks, I think, if I remember correctly, up to 32 percent risk that your protein powder doesn't actually have protein in it if it's not certified yet again. So supplements are not regulated in North America and Europe. You want to make sure that you are taking a supplement that is certified so that uh, you know what you're putting into your body. And we've got another question here and I've got a link to a quick video. Um, I, at the start of COVID, I started a YouTube channel answering the questions I was getting so many questions and I couldn't answer them in time. And they were always the same questions. And so I decided to start this YouTube um, channel with about 30 videos answering quick two to three minute questions. So uh, I've got that wrapped up on there. Wonderful. Yes, the NSF sport and the informed sport. Thank you. Um, and, and there's also the NSF actually has an app. And on that app, you can actually even scan the barcode of the if you have a tub at home to see if that one's certified, and if the lot number is certified as well. So very, very important. We want to make sure you know what you're putting into your body. So let's talk hydration. Um, so through the International Olympic Committee, I was um, very fortunate to have uh, Sports Dietitians Australia um, or the head uh, of Sports Dietitians Australia, Dr. Louise Burke, as uh, one of my professors. And so a lot of uh, the statistics that um, I was, you know, looked into and all the research was a lot of it from Australia. Um, so Brandon, I, I think you're so fortunate to have been uh, had the chance to to work with uh, with her as well. But um, so studies show that fluid loss of more than 2% body weight during exercise is common in most sports, uh, lasting longer than an hour or more. Now, what is 2% dehydration? So I just want to know how many of you maybe write uh, me in the chat box, if you check your pee first thing in the morning when you wake up. So how many of you actually look into the toilet bowl, turn the light on and turn, open your eyes and look into the toilet bowl and see what color your urine is or how dark your urine is first thing in the morning. I've got a yup here. Yup. Beautiful. Anyone else? Yes. We've got three. I'm hoping if you can take away anything from the session, if you're not doing it, you start doing it. Yes, beautiful. Another one. Awesome. Okay. So I'm hoping that if you were to ask this question again in a week's time, Brandon, that you get every yes on there. Um, now, if your urine is dark first thing when you wake up in the morning, if it resembles apple juice, then you are most likely at least 2% dehydrated. If it looks like um, a highlighter, then you're taking a lot of B and C vitamin supplements and you're peeing them out. So if you are taking them maybe right before bed, if it's okay with uh, the physician who prescribed them to you to take them earlier on in the day, then it won't affect the tint of your urine the next morning. Okay. So very much something to pay attention to now. Okay. We've got another yes. Beautiful. So if we wake up in the morning and your urine is dark, can you guess, uh, how long it takes to rehydrate after that? Any guesses there to become properly hydrated again? How long would that take? I've got 90 minutes, four hours. Six to eight. So in general, we'd be looking at a four to 24 hours for full rehydration, okay? And remember, it takes about 40 to 60 minutes, depending on what you have in terms of food in your gut for one sip to start hydrating you, okay? Um, 
so very, very important. I see that, uh, oh my goodness face. That's what I call it. Um, but uh, yes, it is surprising. So if you are training uh, multiple times a day or even daily, this is when it is really hard sometimes to remain hydrated. And I want to finish this statistic here in front of you, but studies show that if you're dehydrated, um, it can take, uh, it can reduce your performance by up to 30%. So think of it, you can be performing, it can be physically impossible for your body to achieve more than 70% of your full potential. Now, most of you will not be dehydrated to that extent all day long, but even if you're just achieving 80 to 85% of your potential, when you think you're doing your best, if you're constantly practicing and training at you know, 85% of your potential, what does that mean when it comes time to race, to compete? for tournaments, for meets, right? Um, so this reduces endurance capacity, sprint times, power, reaction time, decision-making, and skill execution, okay? Crucial to pay attention to hydration. And now I know there must be some of you sitting there drinking your water when I'm talking about this. There's always a couple of them in the group. So uh, that's off to you. I'm, I'm having a sip too. Um, but you should be bringing around a water bottle everywhere you go. So if you don't leave the house without your cell phone, you should have your water bottle in the other hand. And if you're at home, if you're working from home, or if it's the weekend, you should have a water bottle when you go from room to room. Now the overachievers will think, okay, I'm dehydrated first thing in the morning, I'm gonna chug. That's not what you have to do. This will make your urine clear, but it's because it goes right through you. It takes a certain amount of time to absorb the liquid. So you can only absorb a certain amount of milli milliliters per minute, okay? So you wanna take sips throughout the day. Studies show that if you're eating salty foods with it, you can hydrate about 10% quicker, which is always a good idea as well. You're gonna start with two to three liters of total hydration a day. And what I tend to do with my athletes when we're working individually or with a team, is eventually if you, you know, once you've gotten used to this, we'll do uh, a weight before and after training, um, just weighing the athlete to see how much weight we lose in sweat. There's also the ability to use the sweat patch testing and that type of thing, but that can be a bit more expensive. Um, so there are other ways to address this that are even more in depth and more personalized. But the first step is definitely just to pay attention to your intent and adjust uh, your liquid intake accordingly throughout the day. So before practice and training, what you want to pay attention to is you want to focus on hydration. So as I've mentioned, oh, I've got something. Is it a good idea to drink a glass of water immediately as you wake up to kickstart your body? So I wouldn't say to kickstart your body. I know a lot of studies show that, and then they'll say put lemon in it and put uh, apple cider vinegar. You should have water throughout the day regardless. So I wouldn't chug a glass of water. I wouldn't finish one all at once because a lot of it will go right through you. I'd start by sipping. You start with your, you know, liquid with each meal for sure, but not just drinking it and guzzling it all down, but sipping at it throughout the morning um, would be the best way to go about it and throughout the day. So maybe setting goals. If you, if you forget to drink, you might be that person who carries around a water bottle and you get back home and it's still full, maybe associated to something that you do. Every time I check the time, I've got to take a sip. Okay, so something like that, that could make it a habit, make it a bit more practical in your day. To what extent are hydration levels affected by having food in your system versus empty system? That's a good question. So your ability to hydrate, you'll definitely hydrate a bit quicker um, if you're dehydrated in terms of the rehydration but if you want to remain hydrated the carbohydrates will actually hold the water in your system as well so it it has to do with gastric emptying um it has to do with your ability to hold the liquid in your body as well so it becomes very complicated even based on what you ate the night before so realistically we're not counting the minutes but we're really saying let's make sure we have carbohydrate and electrolyte sodium that we've replaced the night before. And we've had that morning to help hold water into the body. So a lot of the athletes who try to eat clean, sometimes it's 
so low in sodium and they've sweat that salt out and they need to replace it. Um, and in other instances, we're going to have the limited carbs, which means that the water, you know, is going right through you and you're not able to absorb it as much. Uh, a gram of carbs tend to absorb about three grams of water into uh, the muscles to help you remain hydrated as well. So it's really that combination of that balanced plate with uh, the hydration that's going to give you the longest hydration effect. Juice will also hydrate. Um, good question. Milk will hydrate. Um, the soy beverages as well. So it, it's all the liquids will help you hydrate, obviously not alcohol, um, but the other liquids will help you hydrate even um, caffeine if as long as we're limiting to no more than um, about a three milligrams per kilo body weight uh, throughout a certain period of time. If you're overdoing the caffeine, it's not a good thing. Um, but uh, otherwise, we're looking, that's why I said the two to three liters of total liquid in a day. And what I've used with athletes before is also the um, Pedialyte. So if it's okay, I'm counting down, it's going to be tight. I've got to rehydrate, I'm dehydrated, or maybe you've gotten off a plane competing, you know, having traveled with athletes uh, throughout North America and Europe, there's a lot of dehydration that happens on the flights and things that we try to avoid, but we'll often bring um, like Pedialyte sticks or Hydrolyte or Gastrolyte. Um, because the, this is a recipe from the World Health Organization to help rehydrate in situations of severe dehydration um, from diarrhea and, and vomiting and those types of things. So it is a quick help at rehydrating. You shouldn't depend on it, um, but it definitely can help uh, if you're quite dehydrated. So going back to this slide here, we're looking at training practice day. You want pale morning urine first thing in the morning, balancing your plate throughout the day. If you don't have to pee first thing in the morning, that might suggest uh, that you're dehydrated as well. Um, balance plate, the three parts of the plate I showed you three to four hours prior to training. If you've got less time, um, we're just going to switch it up. So for example, breakfast, um, if a breakfast where you're not training until at least three to four hours later, you might have oatmeal that's cooked in soy beverage or cow's milk for more protein. And then you may mix in some peanut butter for another amount of protein, a little bit of fat, cut up a banana apples in there. And then you've got something nice and sustain, sustaining, sustainable. I'm not sure what that word is right there, sorry. Um, but that can help sustain you for a longer period of time. Um, then if we're looking at, okay, I'm training in an hour, I'm training in an hour and a half, you might not put the peanut butter in there, or you might put a little bit less of the peanut butter in there. So you can digest it a bit quicker because the fat and protein slow digestion, and you don't have three hours for that energy to get into your system. Okay. And you don't want to burp it back up either. Now, if we're talking about your training or, or in 15 to 20 minutes, then maybe you're just having the banana. Okay. Now, if we look here at, as I've mentioned, 15 to 20 minutes prior to training, this is also called a, a fuel top up or a gas tank top up. So you might be having granola bar um, with this might be, you know, you're going from work or class or, or school straight to practice um, and you just need a little top up because from lunch, let's say, or from the snack you've had prior to. So this is, you know, the drinkable apple sauces. You can even have the ones uh, that are eco-friendly. I've had some at home. You, you can, they're silicone and you can put your own applesauce in it and put it, uh, wash it afterwards. Um, you could do a banana wrap. You could do something like a cliff bar. We're not talking about the protein bars, but really the ones that are containing mostly just carbohydrate or even just a cashew granola bar, something like that. Not too heavy in nuts, uh, dry fruit bar, handful of raisins. So there's different combos that you can do based on what you can digest. Gut training is very, very crucial in there as well. So if you have, um, issues with fueling, you can start with something as simple as maybe 
a juice box or a bit of juice. Maybe you'll then switch to dry fruit. Um, maybe after that, you'll be more comfortable consuming even a piece of fruit. So your gut has to get used to digesting um, close to training as well. And, and so it's not something I don't want you to try this before an event for the first time or before a race. You should try this during practice, during training to see what your body is used to and to help your body adapt to this as well. So during practices and training, if it's lasting longer than an hour, so if it's lasting less than an hour, you should be fine with water as long as you fuel properly prior to. If it's lasting longer than an hour, we're needing carbs to be consumed at that time, right? So we're needing um, to put more gas in the gas tank as our car is going on this road trip. Um, we also need sodium to replace the salt we lose in sweat. So there's very many options there. You can make a homemade version if you want to know how, just uh, ask that question towards the end and I'll give you that, uh, that quick recipe. But regular Gatorade or Powerade, Louis Galno LG1 that you can get, I believe it's from it's based out of Quebec and uh, it's 700 milligrams of sodium per 500 mil as opposed to the 350 milligrams. So based on your sweat rates, if you cramp, if you get headaches, if you see salt accumulation on your face when you train, maybe that's more towards the summer training. If it gets white and gritty, then this might mean you need more um, sodium replacement uh, than your teammates. So Again, we're trying to get the carbs, we're trying to get the sodium. So we're going to get a sports drink in there. We're also going to get maybe every 30 to 45 minutes-ish next to your sports drink. You'll have uh, some sort of carb to help top off to reach those numbers for the, car for, for the carb amounts hourly. So again, drinkable applesauce, dry fruit, uh, gels, gummies, maple syrup is very popular. It's a glucose fructose combination. So a lot less gastrointestinal disturbance. Um, which is why it's now very popular in most of the gels that you can find. Um, but even a tablespoon of maple syrup uh, in, in one of those uh, salad dressing silicone dispensers that you can get from the store, you can put a bit of maple syrup in there, maybe a bit of uh, lemon juice to uh, water it down and, and just take a, a small sip of that about a tablespoon. Um, rinse your teeth after that, because otherwise your dentist is not going to like me very much. Uh, studies show that uh, athletes have the best oral habits, but the worst uh, oral health um, because of all this uh, carbohydrate that needs to be consumed as well. Now, in terms of recovery. Sorry, Natasha, before you go on, uh, there was yes. two knots in the last two slides. And I'm curious about them. So you mentioned the cliff bar with not protein cliff bar. I'm assuming that's because of the protein taking longer to digest. Exactly. That's beforehand. But afterwards, the cliff with protein in terms of recovery would be phenomenal. And in that case, you just have to add more carbs to it. Got you. And the biosteel? Biosteel is so incredibly popular. Um, but the biosteel electrolyte uh, mix, and I've got, you know, the biosteel other products I really enjoy and I recommend, but the electrolyte mix as it is right now, um, they do promote that they have minimal sodium and minimal carbs, which are the two only things you need during training. So if you want to consume it throughout the day, adding it to your water throughout the day, that's fine. But the timing um, is not right if you're having it during training. That's lasting longer than an hour. So in terms of recovery, um, we're looking at getting a three to one carb to protein ratio and maybe two to one if it's less of a uh, hard training session. So again, that about 20 grams of protein and we do need to get sufficient carbs. And yes, even if it's in the evening, sometimes I hear what if it's after 8 p.m., the body does not shut off as if it were a vehicle, you know that you just turn off, it still idles all night. And that's when during your sleep, during your REM sleep, when, when training adaptation occurs and recovery occurs. Um, and so you don't want to go into muscle wasting overnight because you tried not to eat after a certain time. If you're feeling reflux or it doesn't digest well, or you have bad dreams when you eat too heavy, you could go into something like a smoothie um, that you can make, whether that be with uh, tofu and soy beverage or Greek yogurt. Um, as your protein and adding some fruit in there and, and some juice. So there are ways you can get more of a liquid meal. And if, if this, these examples here feel too heavy, but in general, we're looking at that balance plate again. Okay. Okay. 
And I want to leave time for questions um, and to do the poll again, obviously. So I want to wrap up with the main takeaways here. Um, and you may have other ones that I, I want to hear about as well. But I want you to focus on choosing three parts of the plate every three hours. So if right now you're noticing maybe you're not eating every three hours, focus on that. If maybe you're not um, getting the protein in at your snack and it's mostly a granola bar, maybe get a protein source with that. Okay. So if you've got a pen and paper close by, or even with your phone, you want to write down what your, what your changes will be, because it's one thing to learn from me. And, you know, this week you may focus on all of this, but in a couple of weeks, in a couple months time, you'll forget a lot of, of, of what we've discussed. So it is important to have these goals set and have them written down somewhere. And maybe, maybe you can write a lot of the things that you've remembered and think, okay, each week I'll focus on a different one. So you want to periodize nutrition around your schedule. You've got to remember as well, um, even if, if you do have a menstrual period, studies show that the during the ovulation phase, the luteal phase, um, some athletes and some individuals can burn three to 400 calories more that day. So if you're stuck on this is what I need to be eating, or if you're growing and all of a sudden you're going through puberty and you're getting a growth spurt, you need to be flexible and periodize your nutrition, not only around your schedule, but also around your appetite. I also want to remind you to stay hydrated by consuming small amounts of liquid often. So pay attention to your urine tint first thing in the morning, sip on liquid throughout the day. Okay. Also make sure you consume the carbs, which is that first one. Uh, they're the three parts of the plate. So you can actually help absorb that liquid. You also want to fuel and replace electrolytes during practices lasting longer than an hour. And I don't know if it's because athletes go into the sports doing shorter, um, training sessions when they're younger and then the training sessions get longer and longer and they just continue to drink water but definitely a need for fuel so that you don't start burning muscle throughout the training session right and again a considerate loss in speed when that gas tank uh becomes empty and it's not just speed in terms of um time trials or whatnot, but it's, it's speed in terms of speed of movement technique, the flow of it all, um, recover with a carb to protein ratio of two or three to one, uh, in the hours after training. So two to three times more carbs than protein, uh, in general. So first I want to know, um, and I wrote down here, if you do need motivation, um, to stay on track. Sometimes I've got athletes who will do, you know, a sports nutrition tip of the week or coaches that'll do that, that type of thing. Um, or if you've got questions, um, for other reasons, you can check out the YouTube channel, the social media. If there's questions you think about after this session and you think, shoot, I forgot to ask Natasha, feel free to send me a message by email. Um, I will be sending out my slides. Uh, so you'll get a copy of my slides, but, um, you can send a question by email. And I know most of you are probably um, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, social media more, send me a message on there. I will answer as soon as possible. I will research your question, make sure I have the right answers for you. Um, but, you know, feel free to ask questions. It's not only today, but whenever you have those questions, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to help and I'm there to help. Um, so what I want to know right now um, is what are your questions? And if you don't have a question, I want to know what you're going to retain from this session. What did you find useful? What information was surprising to you? Okay, so first question I have here, what about soul food? I love that. So I'm going to recommend that soul food not be consumed in the three to four hours before training in that time uh, period. So three to four hours before training all the way to training or practice or um, obviously training sesh, uh, uh, races and meets and events. However, um, if you crave it at another time of the day, I don't want you to be limiting it to, okay, it's only on Saturdays because if I'm craving ice cream right now and I have to wait till Saturday, it's going to take a lot to satisfy me. Okay. So 
If you're craving it, I want you to go out. I want you to get it. I want you to sit down undistracted. We're not talking about watching TV or on my phone or eating a chocolate bar while I'm driving, but really sitting and savoring. Okay, because there's mouth hunger and there's stomach hunger. And sometimes we just need to savor. We need to um, taste and focus on our five senses. So how does it taste? How does it smell? How does it feel when it melts in my mouth? Is this a 10 out of 10? So make sure you're physically enjoying it. No guilt. Um, because this is part of, of enjoying life. And there's something called orthorexia that is unfortunately very popular um, in athletes. And it's, it's in the realm of d disordered eating. It's not considered an eating disorder, but it's this obsession with healthy eating. And we see it too frequently in athletes where all of a sudden it's their birthday and they won't have cake or it's the holidays and they won't have their family's traditional holiday food um, because they feel that they haven't earned it or it's, you know, too many calories or it's there's it contains sugar. So we've really got to find that balance where we don't feel guilt and we allow these foods. And this is what helps you have more of a, a balanced uh, way of eating uh, long term and a better relationship with food as well. Thank you, Jody. Continuously hydrate. Okay, good. Fueling during training that's more than 60 minutes. I love it. Another takeaway here, sipping water all day for hydration. Good, good, good. And for those who were like from a, a cognitive standpoint, I actually gave a, a national conference on it uh, a little while back uh, in French though, but um, the eff effect it has on cognitive performance to be dehydrated is significant as well. And of course, cognitive performance or mental performance has a big role to play um, in, in sports performance too. Um, here I've got something. Okay. You looked at my website. I like it. Um, type a person just like me. Um, so niche question, injury healing and nutrition st strategies for injury healing. Yes. So I'm actually in the middle of developing webinars, uh, for my website on, uh, nutrition healing, uh, for concussion versus, the musculoskeletal side. So, you know, even bone healing, tendon healing, ligament healing. Right now I'm going through the tendon ligament healing with my PRP, <laughs> but uh, there is a couple different parts to pay attention to when we're looking at, um, sorry, when we're looking at the healing side of things. The first thing is most athletes are so concerned about gaining weight while they train that all this, oh, while they're injured, sorry, that all of a sudden they will start eating as if they were a 95 year old person on bed rest. Okay. You still have more muscle than an elderly individual who is, you know, weighing even a hundred pounds. Like you've got to remember that we, in terms of healing, we need those calories. So I'm still going to recommend to eat every three hours, your size of your plate may be smaller, you may go through the three equal parts of the plate as opposed to half the plate and grains. The ratios are important as to not get any uh, spikes of inflammation, especially if we're looking at a concussion or something of that sort. Um, but that's going to be very important is protecting existing muscle mass. And there is certain supplements that are going to be recommended for that as well. The other side of it, depending on the injury itself, we're going to look at, you know, reduced inflammation for concussion. Concussion is also going to be paying attention to the, uh, the secondary symptoms. So making sure that the person is not having sensitivities to hydration that all of a sudden, instead of being um, a little bit dehydrated and having just dark urine, their body is giving them these huge headaches that they're associating to the concussion, but it's because they're just not drinking enough water because they're not feeling well. Um, hypoglycemia causing dizziness and, and that type of thing may be associated as well to the fact that they're not eating properly. So there's that side. Um, when we're talking um, muscle, we do want to reduce some of the inflammation as well. So there is supplements by making sure in, in all cases that specific vitamin D intake is sufficient. Living in Canada, we don't have enough vitamin D um, unless you're outside uh, sort of bare tummy running around 30 minutes every day in the sun, which I suppose you are not doing in Ontario and neither am I here in New Brunswick, um, that you would not be getting enough vitamin D unless you're supplementing. 
And so supplementing with a vitamin D, preferably certified NSF informed sport, especially if you're uh, training at a level where they will test for um, doping and such. So vitamin D would be a thousand to 2000 IU. You may need more international units daily, but uh, we start with those amounts, unless you've got blood work to show that you're requiring more and you make sure to have it with a meal or a snack that contains fat for maximum absorption because it is a liposoluble, so fat soluble vitamin. Um, if we're looking at tendon ligament injuries, there are supplements, whether that be, um, the collagen, hydrolyzed collagen, or even the Nox gelatin that you can buy at the grocery store. Um, and you'll find that in the, you know, jam and jelly section or baking section. And that consumed with vitamin C studies show can help, um, if you're taking it 30 to 60 minutes before your physiotherapy exercise, or even coming back into training, it can help with, um, reinforcing the tendons and the ligaments and, and enabling them to strengthen uh, throughout those exercises as well. So this is just a very broad um, overview because there's so much for each type of injury that can, you know, that we can go into. Um, but like I said, I, I will have uh, webinars on each of those topics as well in the next little bit. So uh, is, was there an injury in specific, a specific injury you had questions about, or, or were you just thinking in general? Did it answer the question as well? Nick might have gone to get a glass of water. <laughs> Good job. And then issues in the hip. Okay, I hear you. Um, okay, beautiful. Yes, I'm glad that helped. And for the tent, you were grabbing water. I love it. Um, <laughs> you knew him well. Um, but yeah, the for the tendon, the tendon is not very vascularized. So the inflammation is going to play less of a role and it's going to be more of that collagen development. And, and of course, making sure that we protect the existing muscle mass so that when you do return to your full capacity, you don't have as much to rebuild. Um, and, and that would be a main priority. You're very welcome, Stephanie. Uh, how do you incorporate legumes, grains or protein or veg? Beautiful. So for plant-based eating, um, and again, I've got a little YouTube video on that one because I get that question all the time too. Um, you've got to remember that for a plant-based meal, it's going to take more food in general to reach like that 20 grams of protein. So in comparison, let's say, um, half a chicken breast will give you 20 grams of protein. If we're looking to get that chicken breast from uh, the, the protein, sorry, from uh, plant-based options, you'd need about a cup and a half of lentils, let's say. Nobody's gonna sit there and eat a cup and a half of lentils on top of the rest of their vegetables. So instead you might do half a cup of lentils combined with maybe half a brick of tofu and you might throw in some quinoa with that. Now you've hit your 20 grams or maybe you've thrown in some edamame or had a like a soy beverage on the side. So that combination is gonna be priority. The uh, legumes are going to count as protein and grains sometimes or most of the time to tell you the truth. So it'd be like a 50-50, okay? Um, but again, there you're going to need to do a lot of combinations so that it can count um, it, it, you can get enough protein because it is rare that, uh, someone will really have the, the want to eat a cup and a half of, you know, chickpeas, for example, in one sitting. <laughs> now I've got a quote here that I really like that I wanted to share with you all. You're very welcome. That is a lot of lentils. <laughs> So this quote here is developed by uh, Dr. Louise Burke, and um, it's one of my favorite quotes. She said, when everyone is highly talented, highly trained, and highly motivated, nutrition will provide the winning edge that separates you from the rest. So, um, and in French, if anyone there is in French, quand tous les athlètes sont très talentueux, très bien entraînés, très motivés, la nutrition sera la composante qui vous sépare du reste. So I, I really believe that you are all training to your full potential and the, or to your full ability right now but the reality of it is if we can if you're 
right now achieving what you can achieve, but you're not tapping into your full fuel or your best hydration, you can keep doing what you're doing and see more results from it because you are um, pushing yourself uh, to just pay attention to those details. And it can't be always perfect, but it's all about just doing better today than you were doing yesterday. You're very welcome, Sahib. Um, so do we have time for the poll or let's, have let's try and get the poll in okay, let's do it. really quickly. I'll, um, I'll put it back up. Oh, can I do it again? Relaunch. Okay. So I've read the questions already. Please just go through the poll quickly and we'll see. Like I said, we don't get any names. So if you get one wrong, don't worry about it. Um, it's confidential. Um, you are very welcome. Thank you for all your kind words. And uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules yet again. And, and, and Brendan for inviting me to do this. I'm very, uh, very honored to have uh, been invited to take this time to talk to you all about nutrition. Do you have any questions, Brendan, while we're at it or anything that you'd like? I, to I wrote down a bunch, but I, <laughs> I think there were some great questions that came through and um, they're probably a little bit too specific for, for today, but no, that, that was great, Natasha. Thank you so much for that. Let's um, we've got five coming now of nine. Let's see if we're uh, if we've learned. You're very welcome, Nicholas. Is he? Thank you, Alana. Yeah, we've got three to go, which will be two because that you're on that as well. Yes. If you get any wrong, we'll just say you all were gone for to grab a glass of water, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, I'll uh, I'll show the results. Beautiful. Number one, everyone got it right again. Number two, so it'd be about 40 minutes, uh, 40 to 60 minutes. Um, but uh, you know what, if you're a very quick rehydrator, you know, 20 minutes, if you've got some sodium in there, Pedialyte, maybe peanut butter and banana sandwich. Everyone got that one right. Mm. And it's really an hour uh, that you should have the recovery meal within an hour. So if you're not home within that hour, you definitely do have to bring something with you. Two hours is too long. Okay. Carbs and protein and recovery. Beautiful. So you all answered this so well. Um, thank you so very much. And I'm glad that uh, the officials will be encouraged to sit <laughs> at the meets. Um, and, uh, again, thank you. And thank you, Jody, as well for, for the, the kind words. Um, I really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks so much, Natasha. Thank you. All right, everyone have a great night. Thank you for joining and we'll see you next month. Okay. Bye everyone.